Sometimes I get so worried I don't know what to do But all the things I worry about Very few of them come true And when they do I call on you Every time that I get crowded Sometimes I just can't breathe I try not to think about it When I feel it coming over me I know exactly what I need Ain't no doubt about it I'll always be your friend Sometimes I feel like talking Then I don't know what to say Sometimes I have the answers But my questions get taken away That's when I always call your name Friends, with joyful hearts on a glorious day together, let us worship God. Let us begin with a moment of prayer. Lord, for this day, for the gift of life and for blessings beyond measure, we give you thanks. Pray that you'll allow us all to forget about our to-do lists and our phones and everything we have going on throughout this day that you'll help us to pause and breathe deep the air of this sacred space. Open us to the presence of the Spirit in our lives, in the moments that are before us and throughout the day ahead. For we thank you and offer these prayers in your name. Amen. Together, it's you and I. God has made us fall in love, it's true. I've really found someone like you. Will it 
stay The love you feel for me will it say That you will be by my side To see me through Until my life is through Well, in my mind We can conquer the world In love, you and I You and I You and I I am glad At least in my life I found someone Who may not be here forever to see me through but I found my strength in you cause in my mind we can conquer the world in love you and I, you and I, you and I Oh, cause in my mind we can conquer It is wonderful to have an enthusiastic and somewhat out of control group this morning <laughs> here for worship. We welcome all of you, and uh, particularly if you are here for the first time uh, and would like more information on the church, leave your name and email address on the table. Patrick is waving at us right now. There's a little green book. You just leave your name and email, and we'll send some stuff your way about the sorts of things we have going on in the, in the weeks and months ahead. I uh, want to say a particular thanks to Nick Barnum and Kathleen Deach for music today. I should mention that uh, next Saturday, uh, Lake Bluff has one of their famous or infamous uh, block parties. And this one is the uh, Beef for Hunger, where uh, money uh, is raised to help uh, feed people who are hungry. And uh, Nick's band uh, is going to, uh, Hellhounds, right, are going to be playing. <laughs> and it's the same group that plays at church, but we call them, try to call them the Heavenly Pups, <laughs> uh, as opposed to the Hellhounds. And uh, always a fantastic night, and that's uh, next Saturday night in, uh, in Lake Bluff. Uh, other thing I wanted to mention is on the 16th of uh, Friday night, the 16th, right here, we're going to have a first time ever in the 20 years of the community church an event. And all I'll tell you, we're going to try and get this, give you an idea of what that's going to be like. So, Nick, you want to start? And then clap with me. Anybody else have another sound they can make? Okay, we better stop. Sorry. We want you all to stay for the rest of the service. What we're going to have is a drum circle. Okay, right here at the beach. 
Uh, we think there'll be 50 or 60 people uh, banging on a variety of drums. Uh, you can bring your own. Uh, we'll also uh, have a professional drum circle facilitator here. And for those of you who like to howl, uh, there will be a full moon uh, coming up over the east. So uh, there'll be uh, beverages, and you know what? It's going to be a blast. And it'll probably be a little better than what we did here. But uh, if you'd like to sign up for that, uh, on the table by Nick uh, on the way out, uh, we hope you'll join us. You can always sign up for things on our church website as well. So... Uh, a brief prelude, I've been working on a, a writing project the last six months or so. When the spirit moves me, uh, I put a one or two or three page uh, entry in. And this is the, uh, the first entry that I wrote uh, and, uh, a number of months back. And it's titled uh, Garage Sale Buddha. In our house, there is a small nook built into the wall. It's about... Uh, 12 inches wide and 12 inches deep and about 20 inches tall. And sitting peacefully in that nook is, as if designed for it, is an untypically thin, really happy, smiling Buddha that is gold and adorned with faux emeralds and diamonds. And Buddha sits there as if he's really comfortable, uh, cross-legged, kind of Indian style, and from overhead, above him, there is this glow of soft light. And Buddha just radiates this welcoming vibe to anyone who walks past. We bought Buddha about five years ago for $10 at a Lake Forest estate sale. And why I, while I am not generally an estate sailor, uh, I will be forever grateful that we stopped by that sale in our neighborhood on that one Saturday afternoon. Why? Because it's turned out to be one of the best things that's happened in my prayer life in years. You see, as Buddha sits there on the wall right about eye level for me, it's impossible for me to walk past without going through this ritual. First, I place my hand on Buddha's hands. They're on each of his knees. And then just next to Buddha, about two feet away, a little bit lower, is the base of a window. And on the base of the window sits a Tibetan prayer wheel uh, that I bought in Kathmandu a number of years ago. And this ritual has begun where it's impossible for me to walk past Buddha without placing my hand there, pausing for a moment, and thinking about my life and my world and what's the most important one-line prayer that I can offer? And so after sort of giving Buddha a high five, I pause. I give that Tibetan prayer wheel a spin. And I say, Lord, be with Susie who's struggling with cancer right now. Or Lord, help me know the ways that I can be helpful to Sean. Or help Kate and Annie have a safe trip. And it's become such an important ritual that even on the occasion where I march right past, I go, oh, and I walk backwards, and I have to do it. Now, it goes without saying that a Presbyterian minister with universalist leanings who leads an independent church praying multiple times per day while touching a garage sale Buddha and then spinning a Tibetan prayer wheel from Kathmandu is a little wacky. Welcome to my world. Welcome to this church. It's a world where we have no church building. We don't have any members. No committees. For four months out of each year, we worship here in the sand. We don't have a choir, but I know of no place that has more consistently inspiring music. We have a flavor of Christianity that not only allows us, but encourages us to honor and respect other ways of knowing God and other traditions. And frankly, some basic business principles 
as well as theology, have driven the unlikely success that we've had. And amidst our wackiness, in a time of real challenge in the church world, somehow we continue to blossom. Friends, I love that Buddha and the prayer wheel ritual because it's organic. With every prayer, I remain in touch with what matters most in my life. It helps me stop and be the person God calls me to be. And with all prayer, it doesn't necessarily change things, but it almost always changes me. Amen. One, two. Don't stop, stop your dreaming. Let yourself float up on a notion. We can work it out. We're going to work it out, baby. Go ahead, lose yourself inside this opportunity. We can make it right now, make it right now. We live and we learn, we crash and we burn. Right now my only rhyme is this lesson I learned. You talk about trust, I talk about lust. It's not appealing as you truly speak your feelings. I've been looking at the ceiling, so concealing. I should have put my heart on the table knowing I was good and able, but instead I fed you fables. If I could have you back, best believe it'd be forever. Cause each and every day you would hear those four letters. Don't stop, stop your dreaming. Let yourself float upon a notion. We can work it out. We gonna work it out, baby. Go ahead, lose yourself inside this opportunity. We can make it right now, make it right now. Hey, these are different times, but feel the same pains. The blood of mankind running through the same veins. We like to make it right, some which it maintains. Same crimes, even though the names change. And we like different minds working off the same brain. Passengers on different cars stepping off the same train. In the end, making it right's the main aim. Different parts of the picture highlight the same frame. Don't stop, stop your dreaming. Let yourself float upon a notion. We can work it out. We gonna work it out, baby. Go ahead, lose yourself inside this opportunity. We can make it right now, make it right now. Hey, 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 hey. Now if you know what I know, you need to work it out. Work it you ain't out. happy with yourself, you need to work it out. Work it you having out. problems with your family, then work it out. Work it the out. things we go through, just, just to work, work it out. out. I work it out when the situation seems um, unworkable, unreversible. But God, God is most merciful. merciful. Many works, many men converse, the soul search, sweat it out. When they're trying to work it, it out. out. With the constant complaint, we either gonna make it fly or we ain't. I already know what some of you think. I'm a talker, hip hop, and how bad is God? Then try to pull a brother, I'm, I'm not looking for nobody to judge. Instead you want I never thought you was I'm just trying to get with you Pose the same picture You know the mock thing Can move the right thing Do the right thing Made for your life Think I wanna sing it oh, Don't stop, stop your dreaming Let yourself float upon a notion We can work it out We gonna work it out, baby Go ahead and lose yourself inside this opportunity We can make it right now make it right don't stop stop your dreaming let yourself float upon a notion we can work it out we gonna work it out baby go ahead lose yourself inside this opportunity we can make it right now make it right scribe who's been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. And he came to his hometown and he began to teach the people in their synagogue so that they were astounded and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these deeds of power? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? 
Are not his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where then did he get all of this? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor, except in their own country and in their house. And he did not, and he did not do many deeds of power there because of their unbelief. We are blessed to have as our guest speaker today uh, Dr. Matt Duarte. Matt is uh, part of our church family and uh, works with us uh, in a part time way, leading uh, seminars and uh, programs. Uh, he helps uh, me stay inspired and uh, stay somewhat sane. He is a dear friend. And uh, all I can tell you, uh, he's not like any of the uh, teachers I had uh, in high school. And I think we are so fortunate uh, in Lake Forest and, and Lake Bluff to have him as uh, one of the leaders for our young people. Matt? Good morning. How we doing? This is, I got to tell you, so there's the 8.30 and the 9.30. And it's very analogous to my first period class and my second period class. <laughs> first period, it's kind of like, is there a pulse out there? Is anyone, you know? You guys are more lively, happier faces, a little more awake. Caffeine is circulating. It's good. Uh, last time I was with all of you, I gave about a 45-minute uh, talk. and. Uh, I said to the last group, I saw Swami Tommy's blood pressure go up progressively as each minute went on beyond 20. So we'll keep it more brief today. Um, it is August, and around my house, we're starting to use the S word, school. I forbid it until August 1st, but uh, here we are. Uh, summer is a great time as a teacher. Well, it's just a great time, period. But as a teacher, it's an even greater time because I get to reflect on the school year. And one of the assignments that I have each class do is, at the end of the year, as a part of their final exam, uh, discuss the most impactful idea you encountered throughout the year, or text, or character, or whatever. And so it helps me, over the summer, think about what resonated and what didn't. And so one particular class that I teach, uh, Gina and B were in this class this year. They can attest to how crazy this class is. Um, and one particular class that I teach, it's a senior philosophy class. And you guys know The Matrix? You know the beginning of The Matrix, where it's like red pill, blue pill? Take the blue pill, remain ignorant, take the red pill, and you get to see like, what's really up. So this class is basically if, if you took the red pill. We get to explore everything. We explore the enduring, recurring, and nagging questions of human experience. What's the meaning of life? What does it mean to live a good life? Does God exist? Uh, what determines what's right and wrong? Uh, how can we prove that anything is real? Like any rabbit hole we can open up, we do, and we dive headfirst into it. It's a very fun class. Uh, one particular student this year, everyone in the class left. And she stayed, and she was just, you know, I'm at the front of the room, and she's just staring out the window silently. And this is actually not abnormal behavior for her. And I said, what's up? What's going on? What are you thinking about? And she said, you need to put caution tape across the door to this room. <laughs> and I said, OK. Why is that? And she said, because you need to let people know that their heads might explode in this class. <laughs> And she was saying this one of the days we were exploring what I'm going to talk about today. So the caution tape is up. Get ready. And you actually get the concentrated dose. You don't get the, uh, you know, like Kool-Aid where you put the powder in. You're getting the real powder. So hang on. Um, so when I asked the humanities students at the end of the year what was the most impactful thing of the year, I'd say, here about 80% said this particular short story we read at the beginning of the ethics unit. And it's called The Ones Who Walk Away from Omlas by Ursula Le Guin. Uh, it was written in 1973. I'm going to give you a quick synopsis of the story, and then we're going to read the end of the story. 
Ready? Are we ready? Yeah. Okay, there we go. The story opens with a description of the utopian city of Omlaz, bright towered by the sea, as its citizens celebrate their annual festival of summer. The scene is like a joyous, luxurious fairy tale with a clamor of bells and swallows soaring. Next, the narrator attempts to explain the background of such a happy place, though it becomes clear that he or she doesn't know all the details about the city. Instead, she invites readers to imagine whatever details suit them, insisting that it doesn't matter. Imagine it as you like. Then the story returns to a description of the festival with all its flowers and pageantry and flutes and nymph-like uh, children racing bareback on their horses. It seems too good to be true, and the narrator asks, do you believe? Do you accept the festival, the city, the joy? No? Then let me describe one more thing. So up until this point in the story, everything is beyond perfect. Everyone's self-actualizing. Children are uh, absorbed in playing music. They're competing. There's beautiful mountains everywhere. The narrator then explains the social contract of the city. Omalas keeps one small child in utter degradation in a damp, windowless room in a basement of one of its buildings. The child is malnourished and filthy with festering sores. No one is allowed even to speak a kind word to it. The city's constant state of serenity and splendor requires that this single, unfortunate child be kept in perpetual filth, darkness, and misery. Once citizens are old enough to know the truth, most, though initially shocked and disgusted, ultimately acquiesce to this one injustice that secures the happiness of the rest of the city. However, a few citizens, young and old, silently walk away from the city, and no one knows where they go. Okay, So that's the premise. I'm going to read the end here. They all know it is there, the people of Omlas. Some of them have come to see it. Others are content merely to know it is there. They all know that it has to be there. Some of them understand why and some do not, but they all understand that their happiness, the beauty of their city, the tenderness of their friendships, the health of their children, the wisdom of their scholars, the skill of their makers, even the abundance of their harvest and the kindly weather of their skies depend wholly on the child's misery. This is usually explained to children when they are between 8 and 12, whenever they seem capable of understanding. And most of those who come to see the child are young people, though often enough an adult comes or comes back to see the child. No matter how well uh, the matter has been explained to them, these young spectators are always shocked and sickened at the sight. They feel disgust, which they had thought themselves superior to. They feel anger, outrage, impotence, despite all the explanations. They would like to do something, anything, for the child. But there is nothing they can do. If the child were brought up into sunlight out of that vile place, if it were cleaned and fed and comforted, that would be a good thing indeed. But if it were done in that day and hour, all the prosperity and beauty and delight of Omelas would wither and be destroyed. Those are the terms. To exchange all the goodness and grace of every life in Omelas for that single small improvement, to throw away the happiness of thousands for the chance of the happiness of one. That would be the, to let guilt within the walls indeed. The terms are strict and absolute. There may not even be a kind word spoken to the child. Often young people go home in tears or in a tearless rage when they have seen the child and face this terrible paradox. And so then it goes on to describe how a number of the people continue to visit it and then they just start rationalizing how even if they did something, the child is so far gone that it probably wouldn't even help. So they, they rationalize like, okay, well then I'll just I'll let it be. I'm not going to mess with anything. And then here, the last paragraph. At times, one of the adolescent girls or boys who go to see the child does not come home to weep or rage, does not in fact go home at all. Sometimes also a man or woman much older falls silent for a day or two and then leaves home. These people go out into the street and walk down the street alone. They keep walking and walk straight out of the city of Omlas through the beautiful gates. They keep walking across the farmlands. Each one goes alone, youth or girl, man or woman. Night falls. The traveler must pass down village streets between the houses with yellow lit windows and on out into the darkness of the fields. Each alone they go west or north towards the mountains. They go on. They leave Omlas, they walk ahead in the darkness, and they do not come back. The place they go towards is a place even less imaginable to most of us than the city of happiness. 
I cannot describe it at all. It is possible that it does not exist. But they seem to know where they are going, the ones who walk away. So her inspiration for this story was uh, an essay by William James in 1891 called The Moral Philosopher and the Moral Life where he says, one could not accept a utopian happiness shared with millions if the condition of that happiness were the suffering of one lonely and tortured soul. So she read this and she decided as a short story writer to turn this into some sort of uh, narrative. So what is the story about? We talk about this in class and I'm again giving you the condensed version. This is usually over a course of probably a week. Um, most obviously it's about ignorance. And it's about our own moral imperative. And it's about the choice we have to, we all start in ignorance, but at some point we become aware of suffering, whether it's through our own suffering or through the world's suffering. And at some point we become aware of, even if we're not intending to, decisions that we make on a daily basis, practices that we have, marginalize certain people, even though we don't intend it. And so once we become aware, what do we do? Do we pretend the child in the basement isn't there and go on and just focus on everything that's great and happy and wonderful? Or do we rationalize to ourselves, we say, yeah, it's there. I know it's there, and I don't like it, but that's just the way it has to be. Or do we say, this is an acceptable period, and I need to do something about it? And so in class, we talk about these are really the three different moral orientations in life. The first is, uh, again, a life of willed ignorance through usually denial and distraction. Philosophers call this the hedonic treadmill. We just stop paying attention. We only pay attention to pleasures. We pursue them. And as the treadmill image shows goes on and on and on, but we're not actually going anywhere. We're not evolving into our humanity. We're just running after the next thing. There's a certain kind of existential emptiness and futility to that. Second life is a utilitarian framework, right? We have a moral calculus. We're acknowledging problems. We're acknowledging suffering, and we're coming up with solutions. And a part of those solutions is, is just accepting the fact that someone's going to get the short end of the stick, and that's just the way it has to be. But at the end of the day, if good outweighs bad, if pleasure outweighs pain, then it's the right thing to do. Of course, this is the default morality for most of us. It's the default morality for politics. It's certainly the default morality for war. right? And then the last is uh, what we call deontological ethics. And in the words of Immanuel Kant, no human being is a means to some other end. Every human being is an end in himself or herself and should be regarded as such. And so it doesn't matter what the consequences of our actions are. What matters is that the action itself, is it a just action? Are we attempting to do what is just and what is right and orienting ourselves accordingly? And so in this story, we get representations of all three frameworks. A majority of the society is on the hedonic treadmill. They just want to pay attention to the utopia, the pleasure. Uh, th there's another group who keeps visiting. And then they're the ones who are like, you know, this is awful. It sucks. But this is just the way it's got to be. And then the last group are the ones who walk away. And this is the beautiful part. It's more unbelievable than the utopia. Right? A world where there's actually justice is harder to believe than a world where everyone is happy. And even though knowing that, they still continue on. I'm reminded of uh, the Phaedo, which is a dialogue where Socrates, it's the dialogue right after um, the Apology where Socrates is put on trial for the philosophical life. He defends it. He's ultimately um, convicted by 500 Athenian jurors. And then they retire to the jail cell, and he's waiting to get the hemlock. Okay. And his students have been following this guy for some of them decades. And now he's going to go away, and they're going to have to think for themselves. And so they say to him, 
do the forms really exist? Because Socrates is this crazy guy. He just goes around and he talks about how truth and justice and love are real realities. They exist out there. And we need to orient our lives to them in an absolute way. And so, of course, it's almost like the Doubting Thomas story, right? They want to know. So uh, one of them goes to Socrates. Can you tell us before you go, do the forms actually exist? Right? And implicit within that is, I'll be a good person if I know it really pays off. Tell me that this world will actually exist if I do the right thing. Because if it's not going to, then I'll do the whole weighing thing and, you know, distract myself a little bit here and there when it gets too laborsome. And Socrates says to them, I don't know, but what I do know is that we're all better off believing that they are or that they do exist, right? Um, any of you Viktor Frankl fans? This is a quick audible. There's an awesome lecture. I think it's online still from like 1950-something where he's talking to a bunch of college students. And he's talking about this exact issue, the, uh, the moral life. And he uses the analogy of, I'm not an airplane guy, but he calls it crabbing, which is, and maybe the term has changed since then, but if you want to fly to New York, if you aim the plane, you're in Chicago, if you aim the plane at New York, you're going to end up in like DC. So you have to account for this like draft. So you have to point up towards, I don't know, what's north of New York, Maine. And so you, and then you'll actually end up in New York. And so he uses that analogy, right? If you want, don't, don't aim high, not necessarily because you might, you might not end up there, but you're at least going to end up somewhere where you want to be. You're not going to end up further along. Okay. So, one, how am I doing on time? How's your blood pressure? It's good. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. Zach, can we get a, do you concur? Zach's enjoying, what is that? Watermelon. Either way. All right, let's go. So we're almost there. We're almost there. Um, so two more things we talk about is the child in the basement is not just other human beings. The child in the basement is also the environment we live in. And so in class, we do a whole uh, journal where we reflect on the consequences of the decisions we make every day in relation to our food. Because we buy food that's a part of a food system that has its own moral framework. And the predominant ethical framework guiding most of the food industry is one where there's a lot of children in the basement. If any of you have ever been to or seen a CAFO, an industrial farm, and you see the way certain animals are treated for the entirety of their existence, it's nothing short of an animal concentration camp. And are we okay? And most of us here, we have the resources to, to make decisions about food and to possibly spend more money to ensure that we're supporting a food system that's congruent with our own ethical imperative. We also talk about that the child of the base in the basement can be much closer to home. It can be inside of us. There's parts of ourselves that are long gone, pushed away in some dark corner. We don't visit. We don't nurture those places. We don't even let that place come out and see the light of day. We're too busy putting all our time and energy and resources into propping up how we appear to the rest of the world, even though inwardly we're wilting sometimes. Not all of us. So how often do we visit the child in the basement of ourselves and bring them out into the light of day and nourish them? And so I will conclude. I'll wrap up here. Uh, I won't read that whole quote. I'm throwing a lot at you. I'll read the end of it. This is uh, a wonderful from, you could say, a, a modern prophet. Every man lives in two realms, the internal and the external. The internal is that realm of spiritual ends expressed in art, literature, morals, and religion. The external is that complex of devices, techniques, mechanisms, by, which, by means of which we live. Our problem today is that we have allowed the internal to become lost in the external. We have allowed the means by which we live to outdistance the ends for which we live. 
So much of modern life can be summarized in that arresting dictum of the poet Thoreau, improved means to unimproved ends. Stop right there real quick. I always ask my students, raise your hand if at the end of the day, you know you've been doing things all day, but if I asked you, what did you do today, you have no idea, <laughs> right? So we're going, we're going, we're going, we're going, but why? Like, why are we going? What are we actually doing? Where are we arriving? You're close. No, <laughs> you're good. It just takes me a long time to walk over here. Proximity. It's a teacher proximity thing. Closer I get, stop talking. All right. Um, this is a serious predicament, the deep and haunting problem confronting modern man. If we are to survive today, our moral and spiritual lag must be eliminated. And large material powers spell in large peril if there is not proportionate growth of the soul. This is Martin Luther King. 1964, December 11th, we accepted the uh, Nobel Prize for Peace. And so the last thought is, uh, why, why are we talking about this? Why, why, is this? why is this important, right? And I think, as a part of a religious community, religion comes from the, the Latin religio, which means to bind back and reconnect. So there's this implicit sense of, of wholeness in religion, that we're all in pursuit of a greater wholeness within ourselves and within our world. And it seems that the biggest fractures within ourselves and within the world that prevent that wholeness are moral oversights, where we fail to address our own suffering and the suffering of others, because it's more difficult. But the trade-off is, is that when we do address them, and all the great religious traditions show us that when we confront suffering, it's transformative and that through suffering and confronting it, we become more fully human. At the end of the day, I think that's what this whole game of life is about. Dropping the mic. <laughs>
wanna get it through to you You're not alone Oh no I wanna get it through to you You're not alone Kathleen, you just sang lyrics that in some ways uh, tell the story of this community church. Um, we want to get it through to you that none of us is alone. Friends, know that. Know that in your heart as you live the week ahead. Go in peace. And the people said, Amen. There's no need to be afraid.